Hey, how do you know? I said, I'm dating. I said, were you supposed to go to a house last night? I said, yeah. They said, well, we got a CI that tells us she had two or three guys in the closet with guns, and they were going to kill you when you got there. Oh. oh God. I said, wait, I, what is it? I, I thought they were fucking around with me. I said, what is this? They said, well, the guy you killed eight months ago? Was, brother, that was her She's the sister of the guy oh, I killed. The guy you killed. And she flirted in front of me. We got to dating, and she was setting, that, setting me up to be killed. And we're back. We're back here at, uh, in Austin, New York, part two, with uh, the great, the GOAT, <laughs> Ralph Friedman. What's up, Ralph? How you doing? Jim? Thanks nice. for having me. Yeah, man. Here we are once again. And um, I can almost smell the lead. And, and, and the smoke the coming from the stuff. Gun, the gunpowder. You didn't have to go to the range. You practiced. You, you, you <laughs> practice don't work. No, practice on the street. Did they really make you go to the range? Yeah, you had to go to the range. Oh, my God. You have to be identified. You have to qualify. <laughs> the range officers probably saw him yeah, walking yeah, up, yeah. and they were like, oh, no. They're like, Ralph, how, how do we use this gun? What's the best way to shoot, to shoot this? They're asking him questions. Man, it's something. Uh, we were talking about your time in the detective squad, and I think it's so interesting, the fact that, you know, your boss had the wherewithal, the, you know, to, to let you basically not to try to corral you, but to, you had, he had a wild horse, somebody was going to bring him a lot of numbers, and he let you go, and he basically, bosses, basically just created a scenario. My bosses were great, my partners were great, and, you know, that's the stuff that helps me do what I had to do. I couldn't have done it without, you know, backing, you know, boss-wise also, you know, because they gave me the free reign, and, you know, I always tried to make them look good. Well, yeah, I, I'm sure you did. Uh, you were talking about uh, earlier about um, using your own private car, and I thought that was fascinating. And then I know uh, we didn't cover this yet, but you are a, a Harley Davidson rider, right? You're a biker, right? I was. You're a bike? You don't ride anymore? No, I don't ride. I'm into trucks now. Trucks? Yeah. What, pickup trucks? Yeah. Okay. But when you were riding the Harley... You say you mentioned earlier that there were some days that you, you brought the Harley to work and that the yeah I brought my Harley to work uh, quite a few times and it was registered with the department. Uh, I don't remember that part, but it might have been. Yeah. <laughs> but we used it. Uh, we snuck it in there a few times when we wanted to sneak up on people or go by a, an area to scope something out. There was one time, uh, my partner. I was working with my one of my best partners, Timmy Kennedy, and. We were trying to get these drug dealers. We knew they were dealing. We couldn't get them. And every time we went after them, we couldn't get them right. We couldn't get them. And we took a, several different unmarked cars. We took uh, his, he had a El Camino. Were they dealing in the street? Yeah, in front of a building, and then they would go into the building. So in the building, the courtyard would be locked. There was a gate on the, in the, to the courtyard, and there was like a lock in the building door. And we couldn't get them. And when we did get them, we didn't get them right. They always had the drug. They didn't have the drugs with them. So we tried to scope them out numerous times. And we took un different unmarked cars. Then we took our private cars. We took his El Camino. We took my van. We took all different things. Couldn't get these guys. So we go in on my motorcycle. And we still couldn't get them. Right? So When you went in on your motorcycle, you were looking to buy from them? No, we were looking to just get the roll up on them right away because they, they never expected to catch you. Yeah, and we still couldn't get them right, you know. So we devised a plan to go up in a building and cross the roofs. They, you know, they were always connected, and come down the building and get them. Get them from right. behind. Yeah, we figured we'd have the radio car roll up, screech to the front. This is pre Seal Team Six, right? Yeah, <laughs> this was sealed. So the helicopter's dropping you guys up on the roof, right? <laughs> the funny thing is, we get up to the roof, and we're starting to cross over, and the roof wasn't connected. It was like about a five-foot gap. Oh, you could jump that easily. Easy. Well, Bronx we, Street Warrior? Shame, Fuck it. We, Look, we found a plank of wood. Whoa! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and me and Timmy Kennedy put this plank of wood oh, from man. rooftop to rooftop. And we walk across it. Oh, that I'd be a little afraid of that. One at a time. Yeah, yeah. It, was a, it was a little hairy. I think I'd rather try we the were five foot jump. You know, we would do anything to get these guys. So we crossed the roof one at a time. I think that would be the board. funniest scene in a movie oh, ever. Man. You don't jump over. You put the board we, down. We tell the radio car. We got walkie talkies now. We tell the radio cars to screech up to this address and do nothing else. They'll run into us. So we start coming down off the roof. 
going down the staircase. We have the radio car roll up, and these guys run up the building, and they're running up the stairs. We're running down the stairs. And we catch them, right? Would you believe they still had no drugs? Oh, man. And you know what we did? So we, we roughed them up a little. Nothing happened. You know, they didn't give up anything. We, we tell them, take off your clothes. We make them strip down. And I mean balls, ass, naked. Holy shit. We took their socks. We took their shoes. We took everything and threw them in an incinerator. They were, and we made them walk through the neighborhood naked <laughs> to leave. They never came back. Really? That's how you... And it wasn't like a, a ghetto-type area. There was decent people in this building because they all wanted us to get these guys. Yeah. They were walking through the whole entire neighborhood absolutely naked. Wow. See, that's a scene from so a movie. So you couldn't get away with that shit this today. Is not a no, movie today right that would make front page news. Oh, right. We'd be locked up. You'd oh, get suspended, locked up. And you know up. what? That's, that, and, but you, what did you do? You eliminated the freaking drug problem in that exactly. building. Exactly. The, the people in the community, they loved us. They loved us. This was a better part of the precinct. And they told the uh, commanding officer, these, these Kennedy and Friedman cleaned it up. And we wow. never got the guy right, though. Naked drug you know, but dealers. We had to, make leave, him, we had to, leave the we had to correct this condition. <laughs> That's amazing. It's amazing that it actually that it worked, and that you'll never be able to make anything work like that again. Because <laughs> it'll just, people will be looking at the wrong side of it. What happened? The they drug would, dealers were gone. Today they would back the drug dealers oh, and yeah, say we absolutely. made them do something bad. Civil suit. We were cowboys. Millions. They wouldn't. It, not only would it they be just done don't today, understand naked drug dealers. It wouldn't even be thought today. of today. <laughs> it wouldn't be thought of today. No, no, no less done. No, no. no. It's 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 great. I for tell a movie, you though. another thing we had. Well, this is going back in time a little. I was in the four one anti crime, and we were. I was working with my partners, and we get called into the precinct, and the captain tells us. I don't want to use his name, but he was a great, probably the best captain, best boss in the police department ever, and I had just happened to see him uh, last week. I was with him, and he tells us these feds were there. They were making a buy. And the Fed sort of screwed up a little. And the guy that was making the buy got ripped off of the money and his gun. The F FBI agent? Uh, it was, I think it was uh, a different, it wasn't the FBI. It, it was, was a federal a agency. DEA or something yeah, like that. DEA probably. Teach them to go out <laughs> on the street in the Bronx. Yeah. Well, anyway, they called us in. Can you get his gun back? <laughs> they said, get the gun back and the money. So... We looked at and the money. And the money. <laughs> I want the money. I'm bringing the money home with me. And the gun. <laughs> and he says to us, anything you have to do to get it, you get it. That was it. That was like opening the floodgates. I can't even tell you. I wouldn't even have a, an idea of the number of guns and drugs that we took off the street that night. Not off the street, I'm sorry. Out of buildings, out of social clubs. We hit all the social clubs. We just rammed through the door, broke down doors, and everybody would drop guns and drugs. And this is without it. search warrants. This no, is the. No <laughs> I, I very rarely used a warrant. It was the sole of my shoe was a warrant, you know. But we hit so many social clubs, and they were dropping guns, and we, they were getting collared. We give them to the other team members, other anti crime members, and uniform guys. We're taking. They were making like 10 or 15 collars in every social club. And we hit like dozens of them. And we finally got somebody who gave us a tip Whoa. that led us to the other side of the precinct. We get to the, get over there. Then now we go to the 4-4. Four -four, which, which is also well, a Well, you guys were on the job, so you know you're working a precinct. To go to another precinct is a big deal. Yeah. And, you know, we didn't even tell the other precinct. We just go in. You know, this was like, like hot pursuit. Yeah. You know, if a lead took you there, it was like you're chasing someone. You went there, yeah. yeah. Things were unfolding so fast. And, uh, well, let me back up a minute. The one guy who decided to give us some information, we took him into the precinct first. And, you know, the precinct's Did like, you make oh, him take all his clothes off? <laughs> <laughs> no, a little worse, actually. <laughs> he was taught what? What the uh, government used later on, I think we invented this, but we taught him waterboarding. Oh, wow. His head was in the toilet. <laughs> and <laughs> old got fashioned continually, waterboarding. Continually flushed until he gave us that information. That's old style that's that's waterboarding. That's how it originated. Yeah. That's how waterboarding originated. Yeah. Yeah. How waterboarding yeah. originated. They cleaned it up. Ralph learned that <laughs> the from, military the, cleaned from the it plumber. Up. The plumbing <laughs> service taught Ralph Friedman that. <laughs> so uh, 
After he learned what waterboarding is, he gave us this information. Toilet boarding. We got to this guy's house, just kicked in the door, and we recovered all the money. He had the money right in the dresser. Wow. Oh, shit. And he was, after he saw us come through the door, he was very cooperative. Yeah. They put it down. get it. You didn't have Something to about coming through the door. Water board him. He understood that. Uh, <laughs> what he did was wrong. And he had no choice but to give us the money. Yes. And we wanted the gun now. Uh huh. Now, he had to notify someone else to get the gun. We didn't have he cell make, phones in that time. He had to make a notification. He had to make a notification. To get the gun back. And his friend came over. He called the command and control center. And uh, <laughs> when he, when the guy saw us, he became cooperative. And the gun was stashed on the roof of that building. Oh. Wow. We got the gun and the drugs back. In probably, I would say the whole operation took us maybe four hours, five hours. And I can't... The number of arrests must have been astounding. That was probably about, I would say there was about 60 or 70 collars made for guns and drugs <laughs> that night. That's unbelievable. But they were, we got a nice letter in our folder from the uh, DEA on that. They were very, uh, very pleased with it. Now yeah, you'd get great. a letter from the warden of Kiksaki. Yeah, now we'd get a letter from our lawyer, <laughs> you know, report to prison. <laughs> you know, but these were how things were done. And you're not dealing with taxpayer decent people. You're dealing with scumbags. You're dealing with criminals and violent criminals. And they, they, you, they're not innocent. I believe in torture today. If you get a terrorist and he knows where a bomb is, and you're going to say... Well, speaking of bombs, t- tell us about that. Uh, the Puerto Rican nationals. Was that the FALN? Yeah, they, well, they uh, I had, had the a case lead. with... Yeah, yeah, you had, had, you, a, you lead had a lead. Them. I had a CI that gave me... 100% information. I probably made dozens of guns. And cops. getting a good CI is very, very important. It's gold. It's gold. No police department could operate without CIs. And by and CIs, you don't. mean obviously confidential informants. Right. Somebody that's right. and they on the street, not a cop. And not a decent citizen, usually. Now usually they would trading. call them snitches, and snitches get stitches, right? Yeah. Well, no one ever liked the uh, informants, right. ever, you know. But, you know, now they have fancy names, you know. Stitches, and then Confidential you know, informants. But your CI, you had a good... A well, really I had a lot of CIs. These weren't this, registered. This one was good. Ralph, these weren't some registered with the department. Weren't. Oh, they were some, registered. Oh, some, some of them. them I gave money to on a regular basis. Wow. Yeah, I was authorized to get some money out of the borough. And sometimes on small stuff, I'd give them my own money. You know, it was worth it because if I get you get a gun or a good robbery team, you're going to make overtime anyway. Right, right. And you want the collar. So if it cost you $20, $30, which was a lot of money in the early 70s. Right. But you get a gun off the street and you get a you get a overtime, so you make it back. It's like an investment in your job. But I had a lot of CIs that were registered and not registered. But this one was an excellent CI, and he did it for both money and for getting play on the street, because he would get caught with things and you know people would let it slide. You know, you know if you get caught by another cop or a detective, and you tell him, listen, I, I'm I'm a an informer. You're his PBA and, card. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. You know, and they, they let him slide because I would let other guys inform. Informants are a very important tool. If you get them for some bullshit thing, if somebody on the told street, you on the side after a trade up for something better. Yeah, like if somebody told you on the side after, hey, listen, I'm a CIA, I work for so and so. You'd give that guy a call, yeah, verify and if it, verified it. You let the guy go. Yeah. Not if it's murder or stabbing or something, but something that you could let slide at the time. It's the way of doing business, you know. And uh, this guy was a hundred percent. And he, he developed information on the FALN. Which the FALN at the time is... Um, it was a, one of the worst terrorist attacks it's we a Puerto ever Rican had. terrorist organization, yeah. right? Yeah. And they blew up Francis Tavern in Manhattan and killed like four people and injured 56, I think, or 52 and the four killed. So these are Puerto Ricans here that are uh, yes. basically four... Terrorists. Men, but they want to separate from the United States or any involvement with the United yeah. States, so they start terrorizing America. Well, they blew up this place in Manhattan, and it was one of the biggest terrorist attacks in New York or the United States at the time. And this guy was getting me leads. So I went to my captain, and I told him, this was the same captain, this is the other story. So I told this captain what we had, and he said I could work on it off duty, meet with the guy and develop him. Okay. And he let me do that. Uh, didn't even let my partner know at the time because he didn't want me. The captain said, just you and me. Then when it got developed more and I was getting really good information, he said I had to be, I had to notify with him. We both notified. They didn't have like a 
terrorist uh, squads. Task force, then. yeah, joint. Task force. Right. They had what's called arson explosion. That was a unit right. that handled these kind of cases instead of like a joint task force and terrorist task force. So we went to them, and they assigned the detectives to me with a boss. And this boss and me didn't really gel too much. He was a very high-profiled guy. His name was Joe Coffey, very legendary detective who locked up a bit, a lot of, you know, he locked up John Gotti. He was a super well-dressed guy. The department used him for a lot of uh, uh, news conferences, you know, and briefings in high-profile arrests and walkouts. And me and him didn't exactly gel. And it was rough. And he wanted uh, the guy to wear a wire. The guy would never wear a wire. The CI? The CI. And we were going to... We had the guy had to have sta- he had standards. After yeah. <laughs> he had standards. <laughs> yeah. So he wouldn't wear a wire. So I said, I'll wear a wire. And he was taking me to where these terrorists were who actually did the bombing. Wow. But you used to come in there on your motorcycle and stuff? Uh, well, th- different times when I met him off duty. Do you speak Sp- yeah, you speak Spanish, Ralph? You know, I don't at all now. I did then, when being in the street and well. dealing with the people, I was talking enough to get by, right. you know. But this uh, this CIA spoke that could, English. That could save your life. Definitely. Yeah. But you're yeah, going to bars and stuff and hanging out, with uh, well, I, just looking just to see if you can... Well, I didn't really frequent bars, you know. I, I, just, no, I, I do- wasn't a drinker. No, I know that, but you know, I know. So that. I, I really thought maybe was, with the CI you were kind of. No, sort of, we met in vacant lots and buildings. We met in my cars, you know, mm-hmm. my bike, whatever. But uh, he was just great, but he wouldn't wear a wire. We had it narrowed down, so we were going to meet these to meet the terrorists, going to uh-huh. lock them up. Yeah. So I was wired in my own private car. He was sitting next to me. I got a van, an unmarked van, following, with six armed ESU guys in it. I got the boss following me in unmarked cars, and we're wired to their car. Okay, so they're listening. They're to listening. You, to, to your conversation Before in the car. we even get to the scene, yeah. to get to the burps, right? And this guy pulls out a gun in the car <laughs> and starts talking about it where they know he's got a gun. Well, they he turn was... on the lights and sirens and pull us over and, he... and stop the operation. Oh, man. They collar him. They collar my CI. And the, technically, they're collaring me. Because they don't let me do it. They didn't take my gun or put me in handcuffs. They make me go to the 4-7 precinct, put me in a room, and they're holding me for hours. I can't do my my case. I can't leave. Uh, they're, just, they're taking away my freedom. And they're stopping the operation. This, I could have had, to this day. Who made that decision? This squad boss. Coffee? The, coffee. Was he a sergeant or lieutenant? Yeah, sergeant. Because he, he eventually made lieutenant. Well, no, this, he was a sergeant. Then. But at that point, at that yeah, point. I mean, he wrote a book called "The yeah. Vatican Connection," right? Uh, he wrote a book. I don't know. Yeah, what he was always the, he was uh, always on the big mob. He was cases. a great detective, but he didn't match. He was more high profile. Where I was street. Uh, he was a one PP know. guy. Yeah, hey, in all fairness, yeah. okay. But as he, far as the he, CI he goes, with the gun and the CI. Yeah, but I'm, what I'm saying but is, but they stopped. I said, "Listen, you want to collar him? You want to hold me?" Go to the location, get the guys. To this day, it's almost 50 years later, they still didn't get the Well, it was 1975. They still didn't lock up anybody for that crime. Yeah, but Which one, I think I know who it was. I think it was the guy they were going to celebrate a year or two ago, make him the... In the parade. Yeah, parade. The guy in the parade. That yeah, that he was had, horrendous, right? He was the... Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday's criminal becomes today's hero. Uh, yeah, he's yeah, hero. Yeah. They do it all the time. But in all fairness to the CI, I mean, he was going to involve, you know, he was going to go fight terrorism. So, of course, he brought his gun with him. <laughs> Everybody there was going to be armed. If he came in, he was the armed, only guy to stand out. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was. It, was it could have worked out. Put I, it hate, way. It bo- worked I out. hate when a boss doesn't understand that perps have to have their guns with yeah. them, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think it's something, like you said, the, the two of you guys didn't gel. Um, I trusted the CI. Yeah, you know? well, it was your thing. I had a lot of CIs. This was my, probably my best. And that's why my captain knew better to let us run with it and work with us. We had to keep it a secret. But if things went bad, I guess everyone would have looked real bad. Why was the CIA still, strapped, right? But you could have hid that later on. Yeah. Could have, it could have been buried. Unless he started banging it out you with know, the FALN with you, and he was like your You partner. know, I had another CI that gave me some good information, and we got into a tremendous shootout with it. You know, and the boss, I tell you what happened was 
I was working with my partner, Roger Cortez. We wound up grabbing a purse snatcher. And it was the end of the tour. And I took the collar going on overtime. And my partner went home. So it was a, we went past 4 o'clock. We were doing a day shift that day, which was very rare in itself. And a CI of mine comes into the precinct. Like I said, there were no cell phones and stuff then. So he comes into the precinct and tells me, listen, I got a guy selling a gun. He says, you know, and this guy's a bad guy. So he says, you want to come with me? And I said, yeah, sure. Let me go tell my boss because my partner went home. So I go up to my boss who was uh, Sergeant Cantor of the squad then. He was a squad boss. And uh, he says, I'll go with you. I'll be your partner. So we set up a whole plan. And we scope out the area first. And he's supposed to meet the guy on the roof at a certain time. So we go down to the end of the block, me and the sergeant, and we climb up, we go up to the roof, right? We go, we go through the uh, backyard, and we get on the fire escapes and climb up through the roof, and we're on the back roof, and there's like five roofs connecting each other. Not like that roof on the last story yeah. where I had to jump across it, but you could just you could pretty much hop over. Was, you could hop over. Was that board still there that you had <laughs> no, from the last time? Do you carry that board with you? <laughs> Should have. But, uh, so we go up there, and the, the, the deal was that the CI was going to go in the building where he was supposed to meet him, go up to the roof, and tell him he wanted to see the gun. And once the gun was in his hands, we'd be scoping it out. Mm -hmm. Once he had possession of the gun. We would trust him. Then we'd move in and arrest him. And he would be a collar, too, a fake collar. Cuff him up, throw him to the floor, rough him up, collar him, and, you know, they wouldn't know. So as soon as we get up there and scope it out, plan gets a little messed up right away because we see he goes up there and he meets two perpetrators. Oh, shit. And the gun wasn't the gun we even expected. You know, we are expecting a handgun. Mm -hmm. He had a... 30 odd six hunting rifle. Oh, shit. A hunting rifle. And there's two perps there. So now we got three guys on the roof. Me and my boss are five roofs away, scoping it out. And this guy, the perpetrator, the bad guy with the gun, never gets to the, my CI's hands. He leans over the roof and stops popping off shots. Holy shit. Now he's a sniper. To a random sniper. Just to show him how it works? He or? wants to show him how it works. But he's aiming it, wow. He's just pointing it off the roof. Gosh. You know, you believe it? We got an active shooter wow. right, right in front of us. So we right away, we jump out of where we're hiding. <laughs> we each got a gun in our hand, and we start running towards them, screaming, police, and we're jumping over the parapets <laughs> of these roofs. He didn't care about the board wasn't there at <laughs> no that time. just the right time. over the roof. So we're jumping these roofs, and we're running over. Some of them are connected. Some you got to jump over a wall. Uh -huh. Some a little distance. It's like a four-foot... No, how far does that, those things go up on the road? Maybe four feet. Then you got to kind of sort of hop over, over them. And the guy turns the gun on us. Oh, shit. Right? And we we open up on the guy. So we sh the, my, the, the CI hits the deck. He's smart enough to hit the deck. He goes right down. The guy with the gun, we shoot him a couple of times. <laughs> he goes down, drops the gun, and the other guy runs around this, like, you called it in the reports, it said a kiosk, but it's like a chimney, a mm -hmm. little wider, a little higher. It's like a, it like a, a juts out of a rooftop. Do they serve tacos from that yeah. kiosk? Yeah. Or they called ATM it a, there. Uh, it's an know, ATM. So it was sticking out of there, right? And the guy runs behind there. So we kick the gun away from the, the rifle away from the guy. He's alive. He's laying on the floor, you know, slithering around. And the sergeant Slithering. says to me, get Slithering. the other guy, right? So I go around, you know, slowly. I, I pull out a second gun. It wasn't an authorized gun. I just happened to go to the range earlier, and I couldn't get into the range. So I had this automatic, which I never use. And I, I just happened to buy it from one of my partners. You know, <laughs> and I happened to have it, and I didn't get to use it. So I went to the range. What and it better was way to test it out in a live <laughs> so action? I had, it, I had it with me. It was tucked in my belt. <laughs> so I round the edge, and all of a sudden, the guy's right in front of me with a knife raised above his, you know, his knife is thrusting towards me, and it's raised above his head. I feel my finger tightening on the trigger. But before I pull, pull it's happened so fast. Before I could pull that trigger, I hear two shots. And my sergeant shoots the guy in the back twice. Because he sees he's going to stab me. Uh -huh. That's how close it was. The guy falls down, and 
I go, the guy slumps down against this thing, but it was really close to the edge of the roof. Like there was like hardly any space at all. And the sergeant goes back to the guy that's still alive in the front. I go to cross this guy. And before I could even approach him to take the knife from him and go back to the other guy with my boss, the guy leaps up with the knife again. And I shoot him and shot him in the stomach, killing him. With the automatic? With the automatic. I got a little flack for that. Uh, <laughs> IAD went to the a range. Little, a little bit. Went to the range, which was in the neighboring precinct, Olinville Arms in the 47. And they said, yeah, he went in and he signed in and they had me in the book. So it sort of got passed over. The gun was legit. I just wasn't but authorized it was, to carry. It wasn't authorized, yeah. You know, and I wasn't trained in automatics. And so you were on your way to the range and something happened so, while you were on your yeah, way home. So exactly. So justify it. It was all justified. Yeah. And uh, but you, you found out that that gun worked. Oh yeah, it worked. <laughs> I didn't have to test it at the range. <laughs> Save myself. A trip. <laughs> That's right. That and you know what was funny that about that? Who needs just the fun. range? <laughs> about eight months later, eight months later, I start dating this girl, a girl I meet in the neighborhood. Uh-huh. So she gets added to the list. I'm dating her. Things are going pretty good, and she invites me up to the house. I took her out a few times, and now we're going to go to the house. And, you know, have a little fun, right? Uh-huh. So I make a collar all of a sudden. On the way to her house? No, before I was supposed to go Did to Did you her bring house. her to work? Okay. No. <laughs> was she with uh, you? <laughs> she was going to be with me. She was in the me. back seat. I'm the girl while you to be collar. with me. But I get a collar and I can't make it to her house, uh-huh. right? So she's all upset and she's like, no, oh, come on over after work. And I'm saying, I'm going to be stuck all night with this thing, you know? I don't go. So I said, I'll see you in... On the weekend, I'll go over there in the two days, I'll go there, uh-huh. right? I'm going to have to work all through the night, sleep tomorrow, and then the next night I'll go to your house. So the next day, I go to work. The next day, and I get a, a 10-2. Me and my partner were out on patrol. We get a 10-2 to the house. That means report in. So I go to the house, and I, they tell me to go to the sergeant's office, and there's two guys with suits there. So I figured it's IAD for something I did. You know? <laughs> I figured, you know. So these two guys in suits. You're there. not allowed to bring a girl to work. <laughs> it's a movie. So, this whole thing is a so movie. So the girl says to me, I mean, the, the, the two detectives in suits, they say to me, uh, they tell my partner to go outside. And it's just me, the boss, and the two suits. And they say they're detectives from the intelligence division. I say, oh, what's up? So they say, you know this girl, Lucy? So I said, uh, yeah. He says, well, how do you know? I said, I'm dating her. He said, well, you were supposed to go to a house last night? I said, yeah. They said, well, we got a CI that tells us she had two or three guys in the closet with guns, and they were going to kill you when you got there. Whoa. Oh, my God. I said, wait, I, what is it? I, I thought they were fucking around with me. I said, what is this? So they said, well, the guy you killed eight months ago, that's her sister. It brother, was, that brother. was her. Br- she's the sister of the oh, guy I the killed. Guy you oh my killed. God. And she flirted in front of me. We got to dating, and she was setting that, setting me up to be killed. Wow, fuck man, that's a black widow if I've ever heard of one. So it saved you. I mean, think about it. the collars, it's just, man. It's just, well, you know, I've been lucky. You know, all collars, the time can, in my life. collars can save your life. See, <laughs> they do. But I've, I've been lo- very lucky throughout the job. You know, I've been in a lot of shooting incidents. Shots fired at me, even by cops. I never got hit, and I've survived. Guys used to say, you could fall in the pool and come up dry. Did you wear You a, always had to be skeptical. Then, no? You know, they didn't supply us with vests till near the end of the job when I was on. Yeah. And we bought our own vests, but they were so heavy. Yeah. We kept them in the car. If we knew we were hitting a location, we'd throw it off. My anti-crime unit, we went out and bought all 20 guys. We all bought vests, and we bought 20 shotguns. And we sent them back to Savage Arms and had them all sawed off to legal length, 18 and a quarter. We bought them in their sporting goods right around the corner from the precinct. So we bought 20 vests and 20 shotguns. And we had them because the BLA was around, and we drove around with them all the time. We right. drove around with sawed off shotguns in the car. And we were assigned from like six months of just driving behind radio cars right. and backing them up. We were anti-crime sector B. Because back so then they were, they were ambushing cops. Were getting ambushed, yeah. You know, cops mm-hmm. are going about doing their business, getting a job, thinking they're going into, and they get ambushed. Right. Especially black and white cops. They were purposely going after what they called salt and pepper teams. Right. 
Wow. So we were backing up cops, and we always... Do you know, I had... There were like six of the main people of the BLA. I kept their pictures like other cops would keep their sons' or daughters' pictures. I had them on the dashboard of my car. I had them on a nightstand of my bed. I had them on my desk. So I'd see these faces all the time. I wanted to be able to recognize them. Right. One of the shootouts I missed, a joint task force with FBI and NYPD, killed Twyman Byers. I had missed it by minutes. And he grew up in my neighborhood in the uh, 4-1. He was from 172nd Street and Stebbins Avenue. But he got killed on the south end of the precinct, a little more into the next precinct, I think, maybe the 4-2 or the 4 But uh, he was a really bad guy, killing cops, shooting cops all the time. <clears throat> I wanted to get them. I, I came close a couple of times, but I never got one of them. Yeah. But I was on their trail. We all were, actually. But we, the anti-crime was... We were very alert to them. You know? you know, Ralph, it's funny. As you talk about stuff like this, I, I don't think people can really understand what this was really like back then. I mean, it, well, it, it was a scary time. It, it was a scary it, time, it, right? It was a Wild West show to begin with. I mean, and you were ducking bullets from all ends. Right. But that's why politicians and police bosses and police commissioners were on your side. Yeah. They, they were, These guys were killing their voting base. Yeah, you know what I mean? Exactly. They had a... You got to save your And they voters. were predators. They were preying they were upon they the poor predators. people for the most part. And the weak, yeah. the elderly. They invented other squads while I was there. You talked about the homicide squad that came and went. And, you know, sometimes they really needed a homicide squad. Sometimes they had detectives. Do, but then they invented the senior citizen squad. Right, Robin They had unit, a yeah. sex squad. Yeah. They had... Um, you know, all these... Remember the, Safe, the safe Loft and Truck? Yeah, that, <laughs> that was, was an old squad. Yeah. That was more... I mean, just think, of, think of the term mugging. I mean, it's a robbery. But right. it was so yeah. common back then that they, they changed the word to it. We talked earlier. Today they up. say, it's a good kid. He just wants some college money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. College. You know. It's Christmas. We always yeah. used to, like, when I was in the, the squad, I, I was in the robbery... <laughs> I was in the robbery thing. We called it a uh, RAM back then, robbery apprehension module. Today they have posters that say... They have a woman on the poster that says... Why does my son have to worry every time he goes out to commit a robbery that a cop's going to shoot him? <laughs> yeah. Why do I have to worry about this kind of stuff? Yeah. You know, yeah, it's, a, it's sad. People don't. You know what? They it's have, Christmas time. They got cops, men and women, that want to go into this profession and risk their lives. They want to do the job, and they're trained very well. And they want to do the job. And the politicians are handcuffing them and blindfolding them. Yeah. It's sad that they cater to these perps. They get all the benefits. It all goes in waves, man. You know, because the crime happens to be down right now. We want to change everything. I don't believe that either. I think the the newest uh, things in murder is up like tremendously. Well, now you're talking about, but there was a there was a big period there where, um, you know, between Giuliani and and, and Bloomberg. The numbers are bullshit to me. You felt it though in the city, like it was nowhere near the way it used to be. No, no, but they still lie about numbers. Oh yeah, especially I have a feeling. You like see now. how many times guys come forward and say, "You can't even make a sixty-one uh, for certain crimes unless a sergeant reviews it." Right, right. You know they're making they raised uh, petty larceny to like they make the number so high that it, it's, it's not a felony. It doesn't anymore. come to a felony. Well, well, degree. Larceny is. They're, they're scared of comp stat. It's a different job. It's a reporting. A no- listen, you go out there. You're a police officer. You go out there. You lock up bad guys. They're scum of the earth. They're preying on infant. People can't understand the crimes that I've even seen and heard. You know, you know. I was well, in the grand about- jury once on a case of mine, and there was a cop there, pro- having a- indicting a guy for raping a six-month-old baby. Oh God! Could you imagine this shit? I mean, a six-month-old baby and a grown man is raping it. I think this is un- un- this so heinous crimes. And this is what you got out there. But we, People don't know what kind of animals are roving the streets next to them. We talked about, um, you know, suspicion. And that saying that there's, if you see something, say something. And now you tell a cop. These and then all, now there's two people standing there watching somebody you know do today, something suspicious. We got a lot of fancy terms. You know, but with your job, see something, say something. Uh, all these fancy stuff. I didn't even say, want to say your job. Our job was to, if you, to follow and, and, and keep track of suspicious activity. They want the police department to do away with all the intelligence they gathered. Oh, they all that gang stuff, they want to throw it Black right out. Black Lives Matter, Pan- Black Panthers, BLA, FAL. They want to destroy all that stuff. You know what they're pushing for now? I just read in the paper the other day, they want to do away with uh, uh, photos. Mugshots. Yeah, mug yeah, yeah. 
How are you going to get a, You bring in people. You bring them to the photo unit. When I was there, it was pictures and drawers. Now it's escalated to... Well, it's a computer. You know, computers. It's a computer, yeah. yeah. But we didn't have computers. Right. They had drawers of the mug shots. I remember. They used to be in the Bronx borough. How else are you going to make an identification? How else? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't understand it's it at all. impossible, yeah. Well, I guess the whole point is to not be able to. Right. Yeah. That's how you lower crime. Yeah. Forgive the you guy. decriminalize for, yeah. crime and you, you change a category of crime. Well, think about all the marijuana collars that aren't going to be made now that led to something else because it's... Uh, yeah, but you know, they're having a big problem. When they're making, when they're making this drug legal or decriminalize... They're, they're messing up a lot of things, you know. First of all, it helps you to get informants and lead to bigger stuff. It's totally screwing up the canine unit because these dogs are all trained. They're all going to be no good. I read about this because they're already trained for that drug. You can't deprogram them. They're already trained. And now you're going to have lawsuits because the dogs are going to stop certain cars and people. They're going to smell drugs. marijuana in there. Exactly. And if it's legal, now you're stopping the guy. Why are you holding me? Why are you stopping me? Why mm -hmm. are you taking away my freedom? Because the minute you stop someone, when you restrict their, restrict their movements, it's technically an arrest. Right. Right. It's an arrest. And you got to fill out 100 forms now. Stop and frisk is down the tube, which is the best tool the police officers have. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of people didn't fill them out when, when they were supposed to. Well, <laughs> you didn't really have You couldn't. There was a time where they didn't want you to, or and then but there was a time that they wanted the you to. The other way, it's so much that you're on... The, you're more on uh Yeah, you're putting on the, the officer in danger, When I was in the actually, squad, you know? we had to fill out five a month. It was on top of your arrest. You had we to have at least five two fifties filled out. <clears throat> we really weren't required. In the 70s, you didn't do that stuff. I mean, it was different. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, but that's all these things that they're putting on a police officer. You know? That's why, if, so if you don't have stop and frisk, yeah. you're, Ralph, these you people have, you, don't You feel. have to call it stop, question, and frisk. You can't leave out the other no, question, question because you leave out the question is 33 percent of what it is right you mentioned earlier it doesn't that, the question sometimes lead up to that's true right so that's, that's why we got to call it stop you mentioned earlier that a lot of times you'll talk you know to younger cops or you know a couple of generations away police about police work and they don't get it and um i can't help but wonder like these stories are see, so amazing how is this not a screenplay i know you had the tv show but do you well, have, I have a, a well i have some other things in the works you have no, to. I'm really I mean, not this... at liberty to talk about it now, but I might have another series, and I'm, I have some ins with Hollywood. I'm working on stuff. You got to be very lucky, and you got to make the right contacts. I've been lucky so far, and I'm hoping one day to have a another series or a continuation of my series. I'm not out yet. I mean, now that and Netflix has these series, man. I mean, it, I... you got to meet the right people. Yeah. You got to have the right contacts. That whole you thing, got, uh, every got single great scene, stories, that's for sure. every scene is, uh, well, I'm calling them scenes already. Every story <laughs> is a scene. But just getting back to the stop, question, and frisk, when you don't do it and you cut down so tremendously, uh, it sort of makes the bad guys feel empowered to carry the gun. Right. And what are they going to do with a gun? They're going to shoot somebody, assault somebody, kill somebody, or rob somebody. This is what they're going to do. That's what their tool of the trade is. Now, if they feel they can walk by a police car or walk down the block and there's 20 cops turning out and no one's going to search them, they feel empowered. Yeah. So the next step is they're going to commit a crime or an injury or a death. So you're empowering them now. And they got the balls, the way they talk to cops. Let me tell you, if they ever talk to me like that or cops of my time, they'd be picking up chiclets, we say. Chiclets. Because <laughs> that would be their teeth on the floor. <laughs> We used to say, it'd be picking up chiclets. Yeah, when I was a kid, the cops stuff. came by, they said, take a walk. You took a walk. You That's right. You saw a cop, you crossed. We used to play stickball as kids in the 60s. You hide the stick out of respect when a car drives by. You had a nightstick that was a great tool. You know, you tap someone's feet or they need it. They're gone. They're out of the neighborhood. You didn't want to deal with a cop with a nightstick. No. And that was like... Then a, they gave us those PR-24s and those things, you just left them in the car because nobody knew how to use them. <clears throat> Then they break, and then they didn't want you to use it. Then they went to batons. Now they got that ass thing. I think that ass thing is pretty good. It's pretty good, but you know, nothing better than a nightstick, right, though. Not, nightstick. Do you know I still have my original nightstick? Got a few dents in it, but I got it. Coco Bola, right? <laughs> yeah. Hey, let me ask days. you a question. <clears throat> what do you think about body cams? You know, I I don't like them. I I. I there are times that in these times, only because of these people have such empowerment that it would probably work good for the cop because you'll see the people that start the problems. Yeah. But 
I don't like being, look, I know my job. I was trained. You have to put trust in the police to do their job right. And it's hard for cops. Cops are thinking now, every time they go in to do something, they go in to get a slice of pizza, a cup of coffee, there's 30 cameras on them. They feel their hair got to be done. They got to be bright. They're, they're, they're too, <clears throat> I think they get thinking too much. You used to just react. It's reflex. If a cop hesitates in his work, he could be injured or killed. You can't hesitate, you know? And it makes them feel that they're being micromanaged, which they are. I think it's a hindrance, you know? I think since they put, started putting them on, we see a lot less, I don't know, I can't even remember the last case that it was a cop shot uh, an unarmed person that came in the news recently. Well, I'll give you an example. This the Sorensen, the detective that was just shot and killed. Yeah, they took some body cam footage from that, and I seen the body footage for that. And all you see, you can't see nothing. It's, it's all smoke and glass. Right. Yeah, once things start happening and people start moving around too fast, it gets a. Uh... And. They don't have to have it on at all times. They press it right. when they're going to a situation. And the funny thing is, it films one minute before they turn it on. I don't know how it does that, but when you turn it on, it picks up. I don't know. And a couple of them caught fire. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's... Well, it's, it's a new they thing. Might have been, not they might have been trying yet. to mount to something. Yeah. You know, it's just another thing to Do micromanage like the, police. Uh, yeah. And, you know, and when you micromanage... The cop doesn't want to do his job, you know, because he, he might do something wrong in it, or they'll be interpreted the wrong way. Or they got to think about, well, I'm going to be on film. Or, well, you know, every Ralph, cop is scared the, the to be big, on YouTube The today. big thing now, there was even a unit on the police department now that teaches of how to use less force, the reduction of force. I forget what they called that. You were part of that program, right? Where you teach, J Jim Shanahan was teaching Oh, there was cops. also a thing, uh, uh, verbal judo. Yeah, brother, same thing. Same school of Listen, thought. It's like, do you know they sent chiefs from the NYPD to Scotland to find out how their police deal with people using deadly physical... Because they don't carry guns in Scotland. Let me tell you, you know how you deal with deadly... By, by using more deadly physical force. I agree. You know, you overcome violence with more violence. And you have to be able to do that and live with it. And you have to trust the police officers and detectives to do the right job. They're trained for it. They're trained... They let them do what they're taught and trained to do. I agree, I, but, you know, there's you know, a lot I'm, of people... I know I'm a dinosaur. I know that. And I broke in that way of cops protecting your ass, not kissing it. And that's what you do. You go out and you uphold the law and get bad guys off the street. I think That's it'll... the goal. That's that's the goal point. Yep, that's absolutely. what you do. You mentioned the numbers getting fudged, possibly. And also we're talking about a time right now where at least the way people feel is safer. So that's why they get away with this type of policing. If it starts to get busy again, if let's as say, for example, as soon as the mayor's son or the governor's son or a relative or, or a close neighbor or family member gets mugged or shot, then it becomes a big, then they want the cops to do their job. The real police. Yeah, you can bring out yeah, the real now cops do now. The police. Now yeah. do your police work. Well, there's places where they're totally shut down, Baltimore. They're not going back <clears throat> to doing police work in Baltimore. They're taking reports. And that's what the... Yeah. The, the the Democrats, they want that. They don't want them to do their job. You know what's really stupid stuff they do? They do stuff like gun-free zones. Yeah, that doesn't make I, sense. It's so stupid. I heard that Trump was going to eliminate that right away. But I don't know if he did or not. But it's just stupid stuff. Is a criminal and then limiting how many bullets you can carry in an automatic or a clip? A criminal's going to... They don't obey the law to begin with. They're breaking everything in the penal right. law. Now you put up a sign, gun-free... There's, there's a, I just read a list of the places that you can't bring your gun. The Barclays Center, Madison Square Can Garden, uh, Radio City. If you're, if you're on duty, you got to get permission. And if you're off duty, you're totally out. Right. They send you to a precinct. Let me tell you, when I was on the job, it was the beginning of carrying backup guns. I brought my gun to prison. I've been in prison a lot of times. And I went in there, and I turned in my gun, and I had one on my ankle. Mm-hmm. And I wore it into Rikers Island all the time. You know? Who's going to stop a bad guy from doing something? Only a good guy. Yep. So if you have no guns in schools and an active shooter's there, who's going to take him out? Instead of killing 10 kids, he'll kill 20 or 30. Well, they're coming up with these laws all over. an off-duty cop or a retired cop or a security guard. That's retired cops and losing their gun licenses. 
It's, it's happening all over the, all over there. They're coming to uh, uh, update stupidness. their gun licenses. They're retired, and they're they're having them jump through hoops. They're trying to eliminate the amount of guns that are out there, even if it yeah, means a retired guy but carrying it makes his no gun. Sense to stop good guys with guns. Some states Who's you don't have that stop right the bad anymore. Guy with a gun? There's some states right now you lose your right to carry when you retire. That's unbelievable. That's the law. Well, they got the gun-free zone in the post office. And, and I'm carrying duty. a gun. 51 years. 50 years I'm carrying a gun. I go to mail a letter, and I'm a criminal. <laughs> think about it. I, I, think I, right. re- I think I read, too, that off-duty now. There's some states that are saying that you can't carry off-duty, that your gun has to stay at work. At work? Yeah. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. When my time, you would get a rip. That's a complaint, you know, for listeners that aren't on the, on the job. You had to carry a gun and shield. Or you get in trouble. Right. Yep. The only reason they switched to leaving a gun and you don't have to carry a gun is because they lowered the age of becoming a cop and they started hiring 20-year-olds for a period. And there was a lot of drinking going on and some things happened. So then then they said, if you're going to go out drinking, leave your gun home. When I was on the job, you always had to be fit for duty. You know, we know people drink off duty, but... If you took a police action, you better not have been drinking. Mm-hmm. You had to have your well, gun. Well, Ralph, you know shield. that right now. If a cop gets in a shooting, he has to blow in the breathalyzer. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Yeah. Well, no, I do know that. Yeah. yeah. I've heard, yeah they that have was to blow. A few years that yeah. was been in effect. Yeah. Because of that, there was that one shooting with, with that social club where PMD got in a big shooting and they were all drinking because well, they were, PMD remember. was allowed to drink. That's public malls division. And... They wanted to say, oh, the cop that got in the shooting was drunk. <laughs> but you got to understand, these kind of incidents, if they're tragic or accidental or stupid, is a small percent of 1%. Most of the times cops are out there and they see a citizen getting robbed or injured or hurt, they take an action and help that person. It's like getting, It's like the city getting free protection when you're out there. If you're off duty or retired and you see a criminal or something, and you take an action, they're getting your services for free. Right. And the public's benefiting. Everybody benefits. But today they don't want that. Everything changes by the sentiment, how the public feels as far as safety. And as soon as things start going, like you said, a governor, a mayor, whatever happens, uh, God forbid, to uh, somebody that was related to them. But it swung the other way a long time and too drastically. Yeah, well, when that's what letting, happens when you keep, they just keep pushing and pushing, pushing well, and pushing. you know what happens? It's going to swing so bad one way, it'll start to swing back the other way. It'll have to. Otherwise, lawlessness will just take over. Well, you talk about the, the way people treat police officers. You don't have to look that far back. You go back to when Obama was uh, first elected president. He got yeah. elected in January. And sometime in July, that Cambridge, uh, the Harvard professor couldn't get into his house. Right. And then the two of them tried to break in. And then um, there was that comment by Ob- Obama that says he, had um, them, he, had them he called them stupid. The he called them stupid first. <clears throat> first, he said the, the, the Cambridge the police acted, acted stupidly. stupidly. Yeah. And that's a president of the that's, United that's States. Terrible. That Those should have never, ever they gotten involved in this. Never gotten involved. This is a local matter that would, nobody would have ever heard about. He could have taken care of it with a phone call on the side, but he wanted to make it a public thing. And be, from that point on, they felt you saw, but you saw, the moral, you saw that the police officer in this country was not going to be respected. At, uh, the same way it was. It just started fading away. People felt empowered. People that were on the wrong side of the law, they felt like they could talk to cops whichever way they wanted. You're right. And it, was, um, it just changed the whole sentiment yeah, yeah. of the country. And what about when, uh, right. uh, when uh, de Blasio got in? Well, the first thing he said was, uh, you know, my son, you know, could be, you know, the co- be scared of the cops and all that stuff. Remember he's yeah, yeah, yeah. It just it just seems like just an easy it's an easy thing to do because you're trying to get people on your side with the assumption that everybody feels this way. But they're you know sacrificing the police just to get votes. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're looking for a voting block. That's all it yeah. is. Yeah. Sometimes they use you. Giuliani got on the thing. He didn't give us a penny. He gave us three zeros. But man, he got in because he got every when I was when I first got on the job, everybody went out and I got my grandmother out to vote. I got everybody out to vote so we can get Dinkins out and put Giuliani in. Then we yeah. got three zeros. But he did say he liked cops, so that's how gullible we are. Well, we Koch was we, good too. He liked cops. We yeah, but he's probably the best like man. The Dinkins say, gave us a raise, though. We want we he didn't want, want raises, you doing we, not praises. That's what we used to say. Because <laughs> Giuliani just gave us praises. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. But he got in on our on our backs and yeah, then no. stiffed us. <laughs> but nobody, you know, Dinkins, he didn't want you doing nothing. No, 
You know, he did hire uh, 30,000 cops, though, and I was one of them. But that's why crime was out of control when he was mayor. Yeah. Yeah, but that's also the crack epidemic, too. Yeah. That started in 85. Yeah. That's right, when after, I, right after I got out. That's when I came on. 85. Yeah, that's when I graduated high school. Yeah, that crap. Uh, that that's what gave the big illusion in crime too. The big big spike. But was it getting better or getting worse or whatever? If it was getting better, then it spiked up again. You know, and then once kind of that that faded out. Well, that's what happens if you get leadership that doesn't back the police. It streams down from president to governor to mayor, and those are the people that you know control the big bosses, the PC. You know, because the PC is there at the uh, the. Uh, Wish of the command of the mayor. We were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. It's like, what is a cop supposed to do? You see somebody urinate and see sm- smoking a they joint. They legalize while that now. He's smoking a joint while uh, while he's pissing uh, on a tree somewhere, right in the right in the middle of the Can't street. Can't do what, nothing. What are you supposed to do? Have a nice day, buddy. And you know, I said that was the worst legalizing urination. How do you get the difference between a pedophile going to a school? Is the, there's this built-in defense? I was yeah. taking a pee. Yeah. Meanwhile, he's showing his pecker to young kids. Yeah. Right? I mean, turn on the body cam. He's got a, (laughs) but it's a a defense. Yeah, no, it's ridiculous. I don't think a lot of this stuff is thought through. It's just a question of just keep pushing and pushing. Legalize this, decriminalize that, take the power away from the police. Well, the whole broken windows policing, which got us to. Is out the window, yeah. And the cops worked 20 20 years, two decades. Right, I worked real, we all worked real hard to bring the city to a level of decency where it is now. and they're throwing well, it away. The, decades are, being, it the away. decades are being set back in, in a year or two. Yeah. <laughs> it's just homeless people laying over the subway trains. They're all the over borough, the sidewalk. You figured they would sit down. You figured up. they would sit down and pop in a movie like uh, Saturday Night in Fort Apache and just watch <laughs> what the city could be like if we ever went back. And they don't do that. No. It's, should, right, it's not that far behind. They should have Ralph go to a city council meeting, you know? Yeah. And address the show city council. Street Warrior, the you know, city council. Yeah. Show Street Warrior. Yeah. Have him show the his street, tats. Just the uh, these community boards and stuff. There, they're not, you know, pro police. No, either. no. The one in Manhattan isn't. I no. know that. They, 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 they don't back. They're all they're, the politicians are falling in line against the police. Yes, because it's, it's a popular hated. thing to do. But look how they wanted to make the guy from the FLAN. The, the the honorary uh, right. marshal of the parade. Right, that was horrendous. The guy's a terrorist. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't Some way it. that didn't happen. Someone. The general was public has a short yeah. memory. A couple of uh, big uh, um, sponsors pulled out the last minute. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, the first one to pull out, I think, was Goya. That was that, was that Mark Viverito. She's yeah. the yeah. She was pushing. She was that. pushing. Yeah, she's another uh, oh, excellent man. politician. You know. The progressives, uh, you know, progressive. Liberals. What does that mean? Progressive. It means against the police, I guess. Right. It means uh, pushing forward. Pushing yeah, forward. The, the idea is wars. that there, there's um, there's Do a utopia. Yeah. yeah. There's a utopia waiting ahead of us, and we have to keep pushing until we get there. It's one. It's a world where there's no borders. Yeah. Uh, you can roam around back and forth. Yeah. People give you stuff for free. You know. For you no know, it's funny. <laughs> there were comments on uh, Facebook a lot about. You know the Oscars last night. Yeah. So they had uh, they had gates around the thing, so you couldn't get in. But they don't <laughs> they don't want gates nowhere no, else. Nowhere but else. At their party, they don't, they have yeah, guards yeah. and guns and gates and wires, and no one can get in. Why? One of my why wasn't it open? One to of the my public? favorite expressions was, "You want to see a liberal turn into a conservative? Just step on his land." Yeah. And then he'll yeah. turn into a, you exactly. Know, he'll pull out his AR-15, which well, is I mean, look where we are right now. <laughs> and then you had Bloomberg saying. People that own guns are stupid, but he's yeah. surrounded by a um, bunch guns. of detectives yeah, um, guns. with guns. You know, yeah. how do they feel yeah. when he says stupid. things like this? Yeah, that's well, all the people that say that. Pelosi too. Walls. She's got walls. They all got She's... walls, security guards, and guns. Same thing with socialists. Show me that's a socialist, I'll show you a millionaire. You know, every socialist that pushing socialism. Socialism is for you, not for them. For them. Yeah, it's exactly. right there. It's all you got to do is turn on the TV. Yeah, they, right, they want they full want, control. They want the government to have all control of your money. You know, so I, I'm I'm sorry this turned into a rally. Hey, let me ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> While we have you here, I read in the book you said vacations are overrated. Are they still overrated? Do you take money now that you're retired? Can you? Actually, I don't. I've been spending the money on my house. We haven't been on vacation for a while. My wife doesn't like to fly since 9-11. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is your yeah. Wife, was your wife in law enforcement or no? No. 
She actually took the test, and they called her three times, but I made her back out. Because yeah. in those years, how many years you've been married? I'm with her 36 years. Wow. Right, uh, I started seeing her four months before I got off the job. Good for you. You know, she was there with me when I had my accident. But I was dating a lot of girls at the time, and uh, when I went to the hospital, they all met each other. <laughs> <laughs> I woke up one day. There was seven girls around the bed. Ralph, did and you ever? And she went to meet them. Well, I made like I passed out from the drugs again. Ralph, did you <laughs> ever want to deal with? Did it. you ever bring your wife to work? No, she, no. Didn't <laughs> she never went. To you work know what's with amazing you. though is how well they can get along. They can well, all really I, just get along. At some point, they're going to get along. They, they, they're girls. They like the same thing. You should just be able to invite. Listen, girls, we all have one yeah, thing in common. That way. We love me. You know what's? <laughs> you know what's amazing? I just when Ralph Ralph got here. An hour early, which you know, I can tell he's a prompt guy and he wants to scope the situation out. He's a bull, man. I shook his hand. I was like, "You're 70 years old, right?" 70. This guy is like, still, I wouldn't want to roll around with this guy. <laughs> what are you benching these days? You're still putting up heavy weight? No, no, I can't do heavy weight. Well, your man. shoulders. Are I almost... work out my shoulder, my biceps detached, my yeah. both rotor cuffs are torn, but I still work out. You still I work mean, out. Know, yeah, I got to do something. Yeah. More, it's more of a, it's a mind thing. You know, you got to feel like you're doing something. Were you, you, gotta ju get the were you juicing something. back in the day? No, I never juiced. No? No swine no, I hormones? Did, I did that the old-fashioned <laughs> way, too. I worked out hard. Yeah. I worked out hard and long. No HGH? I was, I'll be no honest. Swine flu I wasn't hormones. scared of facing guys with guns. But I was scared of drugs. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't know what steroids could lead to. Right, right. You know, I just, uh, I never drank. I never ate junk Back food. in the day, what were you benching? I benched uh, 395 on a machine. And I benched 380 in free weights. That's nice. That's good. That's and that's with, you know, never no, ju any, no, no juice. No juice, nothing. That's, that's just it, with Gatorade. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, orange <laughs> juice. Those days I was drinking, a, I'd come home and drink a quarter of milk with a whole pie. <laughs> but, but you know what? Nothing. You're still in great shape, but you're making pizza now, right? Yeah, I, I, I do. I work in a pizza store. You do, right? Down in yeah. the village? Down in the village. And you're making the pizza? No, no, I don't make pizza. Did you? Are you interested in learning how no, to make it? No, no, no. I just, uh, like a floor manager. Uh-huh. You know, work the register. Uh, you know, just a little part-time gig. Do you My know Steve Nolan that owns the uh, the Fior? No, Steve is a retired uh, firefighter. He's got a place on um, what is it? It's a McD um, it's Bleaker. He's got a place. It's called uh, De Fior. Well, I'm on Bleaker. Yeah, it's Bleaker Pizza, and my friend owned it. He's not alive now, but he was a captain, and he got sick from uh, the 9/11 thing terrorist attack and he was in the, the task force then yeah he was the executive officer of the uh, manhattan south task force and they were down there f the first 40 days and nights he got very sick from that and a year ago he killed himself because he couldn't take the pain no more and wow. the doctors couldn't do anything to help him yeah, he, he wanted to end it you know, he wanted to he, end. he always uh told me he says uh you know just make sure you tell people i was never crazy and i was wasn't depressed Mm -hmm. I just couldn't handle the pain no more. Just like you would put your dog down. He says, I have to put myself down. Well, you know, sad, right? Very sad. It. He was a good guy. He was a friend of mine, not from the job. I met him after the job. And uh, we knew each other like 25 years. And he retired for, because of the 9-11. And then he opened the pizza store. And he didn't really work there. And, and uh, I hung out there with him. you know. And then uh, when he got very sick near the end, I started working there. You know, a couple of hours on the weekend. Mm -hmm. And uh, people could come down here and see you, though, on the weekend? Oh, yeah, people come down and see me all the time. Yeah. Do they, if you buy a slice, can you get a free war story? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you a free slice. Too. A picture. Get at least a picture, right? Uh, I want a picture with Ralph with a, with a slice of pizza, you know? Yeah, I'm going to come I down. Pose for we should call it war, war Story Pizza Shop, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm going to come down for that. I want to do that. That sounds okay, like that's great. Man. Definitely invited. I do all the comedy clubs down there, perform there. So I'm mean, now now I know I'm gonna come down there. You gotta meet Steve though. Um he's on Bleaker too. He's uh right next oh, door. Well that's to how you know my friend Pat Dixon. Yeah, I'm a comic. He's a comic. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know Pat for a long time. No, but he Pat, does the series, he does the comedy. I've been on that show plenty of times. You've been on the New York yeah, City yeah. Crime Report? Yeah, plenty of times. Yeah, I've been on like six or seven times already. Yep. He's a great guy. Yeah, I love Pat. Pat's my yeah. buddy. I got nothing bad to say about Pat. Not a great guy. So I'm, I'm trying to think, of, is this something that we didn't cover yet? Oh, I got plenty well, of stories. Ralph, Ralph Tell, well, let me ask you something, though. Where do you, where do you go from here? Hmm. You're 70 years old. You're well, retired. I'm you trying get these... to get my foot in the door in Hollywood. Okay. I'm hoping for a second season with ID. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, 
For the um, listeners, uh, he, Ralph had a show on ID called uh, Street Bronx Just- Street Warriors, right? No, Street Justice the Bronx. Oh, Street Justice the, the Bronx. The book was okay. Street Warrior. Okay. Um, we didn't go with the same name because when uh, the show started out on Discovery, and they thought the name Street Warrior was too much sounding like a car show yeah. because they do a lot of uh, garages and street racing. Right, right, right. So All they these. thought the connotation Street Warrior was more towards cars. So we kicked around names for a while with marketing people and the execs and stuff, and they came up with uh, Street Justice the Bronx. As a matter of fact, uh, there's two dots after Street Justice, then it says the Bronx. Okay. It's the only show in history that has those two dots <laughs> in between the words. <laughs> Tell us about the clothes a little bit, because I'm looking at the sweatshirt you're wearing, and it's pretty cool, man. It's got a skull. Well, actually, this is a a, a sweatshirt from a friend of mine. Oh, okay. But um, my clothing line is under barbells and badges. Uh, And you look it up, and there's a line, Street Warrior. Okay. And I got involved with that, and I let them use my name, and I helped them with designs. And they change the design every couple few months. And uh, they sell... We usually do one T-shirt and one sweatshirt at a time and one female V-neck. And it's under barbells and badges. You can look it up. Yeah, I got to check that out. Are we going to be Bar- able to take... Did you bring any shirts for you today? No, I didn't bring See, any. See, we like to... You know, we're retired. We like to glom shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that? Go My on. deal with them Cops is I, always like I only shit. get one, uh-huh. and I have nothing to do with mailing them or uh-huh. orders or anything. You know? I remember when I got on the job, I, at first uh, we went to like a, some street fair. I was with some veteran cops, and they go up to, like, the first thing that they see with the shirts. They says, hey, how's, how's the shirts there? You got a, an extra? <laughs> Mayor, what do you wear? I, said, I was a double X at the time because I was pumping up. And I, I we just took the shirts and we walked away. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> Went back to the car. That's a cop car. thing. Yeah. Charge this to the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Get a shirt. Everywhere you went, you got to show. So, Ralph, who would play you, man? Who would play you if... I'm uh, hoping if that it, that's my problem one day. Yeah, with someone that's in, in a problem. movie, you got to get I some... I always liked um, the Warburg brothers. Uh-huh. All Donnie the ones and that Mark. are on uh, Blue Bloods. Blue now, Bloods yeah. and yeah. The, um, uh, Mark did a lot of movies. He played yeah. police, police or detectives. I, I always... I He's great. That. He's great, I but I like to see somebody problem. else do yeah. it. Yeah. I like to see... I'm trying to think of who I like to see do it. That should be You got dark hair, right? You had dark yeah. hair and the beard, right? Well, the guy was pretty close to me, you know, who played in Street Justice, the Bronx. Uh-huh. Timmy Wynette is an actor, and uh, he got really into the part. He was, uh, it was really good meeting him and uh, discussing things with him, and he got into it. He was a bartender and a part-time actor, and uh, he really took on the role very seriously. And he, you know, he went to, he did a little boxing school. He took, went to motorcycle school. He went to police tactics. He went to gun training. He did everything to get into it. Wow. It was, uh, it was. He got into the part. And if you watch, the, you don't have to watch my series in order. It's not an ongoing like soap opera or something. Uh-huh. It's individual stories, so one doesn't lead to the other. But if you do watch it in order, you'll see how he progressively gets better and more comfortable in the role of playing me. So yeah, what, I'm trying to think you, of somebody who's young to get right another now. season. See, they don't tell you anything. They call it hiatus. Yeah. It's like you're in the twilight zone. They don't talk to you. They don't tell you nothing. Right, right. Or tomorrow they could call me and say we're filming Monday. Right. You know, but the show, it is progressing on in other countries. I started in seven other countries. How many, let me ask you, per episode, how many viewers were you getting? Do you know? Uh, In the 800,000 range. Okay. You know, which is pretty good. Yeah. But I, I think my show... Uh, Bill was a big star a on Perfect Murder. Because yeah, we were getting a, mu- a million on the Perfect Murder. Yeah, I was getting yeah that, but they know. canceled it anyway. Really? Yeah, and they got they averaged a million in the last season, and they still canceled it. So who knows what the hell's going on? You know, they have their own rhyme and reason. Yeah. You know, you can't figure it out. I had a lot of sponsors. As a matter of fact, people were complaining when the show first came out. There were too many commercials. Right. They were selling a lot of time. And what happened with my show, there was a few different things that... that uh, holding it up, I think. One was that they didn't give it enough advertising, and then the show caught on, and then in mid-season they stopped and waited a while and started again on another network. The first network that we wanted to take it was ID. Right. And what happened was ID didn't take it, and Discovery picked it up. And Discovery wanted, like you said, a they wanted a million people a right, week, right. and I was hitting seven fifty, eight hundred thousand, and they they didn't think that was good enough. And then ID took it on the second episode. 
They took it and showed it on their – while it was on Discovery, they showed it because one's a parent company. Right, right. And they showed it, and they liked it. So they took the show over after the third episode, and they wound up showing three new episodes and the three that played already. But there was a couple of months lag in between. And there wasn't enough in, – in my there wasn't enough uh, – Advertising, right, right, right. Pro- they gotta promote, promote it. it. Yeah, they no. gotta promote it. Yeah, yeah. you know, and uh, that leg and that cut in the middle of the season hurt me. I think. Yeah, I like to see it as a dramatic series. I like to see it on Netflix. That'd be amazing. Well, a yeah. dramedy, you know, something where it's uh, it's, yeah, your, it's dramatic. your show is really a reenactment. It's basically, talk about, yeah, I host, it's ba- I tell yeah, the story. I like to see it like a like a scripted scripted show yeah. on Netflix, a couple of seasons, um, each episode. Gets a story. See, maybe, my lines maybe it weren't expands scripted it. like that. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about com- something completely Well, they different. tried to... The, I'm talking the about deuce, there's a lead. The Deuce on HBO now. That was a good show, too. Yeah. And, you know, Paul, their second season took, like, a couple of years to come yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. No, but that's you yours could why. be like that. Yeah, I like want to see... I want to see... We needed more money for production, yeah, too. Yeah. Or Ralph Friedman is the... Is the, the protagonist. He's got his partners that, that that come and go through the years. But every scene, every every episode, there's freaking chase scenes. There's him with, well, with another was, hot girl. Right. Well, my show Bring was... Some of them aren't so work. hot. Some of them are like, you know, some girls that are, you know, the, in between the hot girls. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Some of them get the motorcycle. The other one... We have a little... We have one, some one of, Some of them, like, cook some the food. Some of them get the ride of the motorcycle to the neighborhood. And some of them get the car. They sit in the back seat. <laughs> some of them he takes on jobs. Some of them... Yeah, some he, don't want not, he don't want them getting hurt. Some of them just goes and they cook them rice and beans. He goes. Over there. <laughs> Some of them he brought out. He wanted to scare the perps. <laughs> Let's take a look at you, baby. <laughs> but so, um, so they want to. But find you know you. the police rule: if it was new stuff, you go out of your way. You get there. Yeah, yeah. You know, if it's somebody you had already, they could wait. Yeah, you t- I, I love the um, the making the collar. I remember sometimes you'd have a date, and you didn't really make the collar, but. He made a collar. So this way, you, it was dinner and a movie. And then it turns out, oh, honey, I made a collar. Oh, no, my partner made a collar. I'm going to be I'm gonna be a little late. Uh, give me a couple hours. And then now you show up at 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night. They're already dressed. They still want to go out. and But there's not that many places to go now. Go to my apartment. <laughs> we'll catch a movie on another night, sweetheart. Uh, Grab that beer. I got your beer. So uh, we could find you down. Uh, one thing about the movie too that, uh, I, like I said, a, a Netflix, a dramatic series. Well, I'm ongoing. trying. That's what I'm, my goals are now to try to to get into an, another show or another. I'm filming a show on in two weeks. Uh-huh. I'm doing a show for Raw TV that has their network out of London. They're based, but they're just shooting me. In. They're bringing my partner up from Florida, and they're gonna get us an old car. We're gonna patrol in the Bronx. And tell stories out of the car. That's great. That's like yeah, uh, off the cuff. Bell did that. We did that. We, we, yeah. we had uh, our original thing was a web series. I don't know series. where that's going to go, but I'm doing a one-day shoot. Yeah, me know? and Bill had a web series like yeah. that. We used to drive around. And basically, we would go with two places to eat in particular commands. And while we were stopping to get something to eat the way we did on the job, we'd also tell so war some stories. stories. Something happened yeah. over here in this corner. Oh, this is where you we used to You guys were partners? No, 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 but for our show, we oh, did that. Yeah, we drove yeah. around in our private car. We even got pulled over one time. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and the cop was... While we were filming. Yeah. And they they you didn't know. see all the big trucks following you and stuff? No, well, we, did, we just... Uh, the camera was... Uh, the car was full of we cameras. We had a go camera oh. right on the dashboard. Oh. Yeah, like all yeah. over these go cameras. I drove around with uh, people following me. Yeah. Uh-huh. I had cameras strapped on the fenders and hood of my car. Mm-hmm. You know, that... that uh, uh, the production company did for promotions and stuff. Well, you know, people got pissed off that they the cop let us go. People that watched it, well, what are you kidding me? You think oh, really? he's gonna give us a summons? Yeah, that's stupid. <laughs> yeah, they actually got annoyed that we got away with it. Well, I wish you the but best those of are the luck, goals man. Now I'm this... trying to get into these things. I mean, I can't. I, and I'm I having fun with the interviews. And I can see me the, auditioning for it. I do book signings at car shows and motorcycle shows. I set up a booth and I get a kick out of it. That's great because I like going to these kind of shows anyway. So I see the cause, and I... Uh, so, Ralph, uh, if you get famous, will you still come back on Police of Off the Cuff? Absolutely. Oh, that's great, man. I'm definitely going to push for this it. It's an honor think, to come back. This is great. No, this is an honor to meet you. No, it's it was, an honor to be here. Yeah. I, I, I like that you wanted me to have, have me on and stuff. It's my honor. That's no, great, I man. think what we're trying to do here is we're trying to... Uh, like, for example, you have a book, you know, Street Warrior. 
And uh, well, you great, mentioning yeah, no, it's a great book. Too, I, it's I a great book, that. but there's a lot of great cops. Maybe not as great as you, but there's a lot of oh, great cops out there that retired. Um, Michael O'Keefe and, wrote, wrote uh, "Shot to Pieces," but I'm not talking about on, the yeah. ones who have. We're, we're, we're getting those on because of the high-profile ones, but I'm right. interested also too in getting cops well, that, that retired and they didn't. They, their stories are going to just pretty much die out with them. You know what I'm saying? Well, it's their family and their cop, friends. Stanley Gam. Mm-hmm. He was he was like this real heavy hitter in the four one when I got there, and he had probably the biggest influence on my career. When I got there, and I was a rookie, I seen this guy, he was in uniform, rack of medals up his chest, you know, and he would come in every single day with a gun or felony drug collars. Every day, and I looked up to this guy like, you can't believe, I said to myself, I want to be like this guy. I want to be like him. And I wound up getting into the anti-crime unit, which by that time he was in, and then one day I became his partner. He just recently died, like a month ago. And uh, I, this guy was, he was tremendous. And I had great partners. I had this guy, Roger Cortez, when I got into the de- detective squad. He was an old timer, but we hooked up and he got real active again. He loved it, you know, being out there and making pickup collars. I had, my two best partners were probably Timmy Kennedy and Lester Rudnick. I know all the Bronx <laughs> heavy hitters. You know, there was Robert DiMartini, uh, oh, he was a, became a street crime lieutenant, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned this in your book, too. You said uh, the difference between sports heroes and real heroes. Right. Real heroes are R-E-A-L, and sp- the other heroes are real, R-E-E-L, for film. The make-believe guys that are aiming for a gun in someone's hand. And that's, know, what, that's why we want to take the real ones, the real, the R E A L. There's heroes. a lot of real cops that's out there. Right. And we want, to, we want to be able to kind of sort of memorialize their careers in a way. So then, this way, if you and, don't have a book, it's not forgotten. The stories it, are still out there. I just They're went great to a stories. street naming for an officer that was killed in 1984 or 85. Uh, Ruotolo. Ruotolo. Yeah. 1984, I think it was. Yeah. That guy was a hero. That guy took a police action and took a bullet and got killed. Yep. You know, and then my part, I had another partner, but that wasn't his partner when he got killed, was Kenny Mann. You know, I still to this day have his uh, card, his mask card on my desk, you know, and he was killed in the December of uh, 74 also. That's a long time you know? ago. There's no rhyme or reason to it. When you put the uniform on and you take on this job, you never know. There's always a chance as soon as you step out of that precinct that Well, that's it. The whole happen. job is you're putting your life on the line right. for a stranger yet. Look at Detective Simonson. May he rest in peace. A second. He was going on um, a 19 robbery. and a half years. Yeah. But he was I, driving I th- around. I think he was... Um, you know, he wasn't the even... Circumstances, sp- yeah, he wasn't, wasn't the supposed circum- to work that day. Yeah. He is a, a DEA delegate. Yeah. And they had a DEA meeting that day. So he, he could have switched his sh- shift. He was supposed to do the day shift. He came in after that after the meeting and went to work. He was entitled to be off. Yeah. He came in and went to work and did police work and then responded to a job that uniform officers were picking up, which guys in anti-crime do and detectives do all the time. You hear have a heavy job and you're in the car yeah, and you you're back, mobile. You back them you're up. You're going to back yeah. them up. But sometimes you get there first. You know, that happened with a partner of mine. We were in anti-crime, me and Cal Unger. And uh, we hear a burglary in progress, a girl screaming for help. And we responded. We say, we'll take the backup. And we got there first. We go up a five-floor walk up, get up there. We see a door broken into. It's off the hinge. You know, the, the door jam is broke. It's open about six inches. And then we hear a girl screaming. We go in. It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. He's not my regular partner, but we both got back from court, so we team up together. So we go in there, and it's pitch black, but it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. They had drapes and blankets, everything over the windows, and we hear a scream coming from in the back of the apartment. We go into this hallway that leads to the rear bedroom. All of a sudden, a guy jumps out in front of us, three feet away, and opens up fire. We're in a hallway. Wow. The bullets are ricocheting off the wall. The bullets are right at us. We're three feet away and getting closer. And we exchanged 18 rounds, the three of us. Um, I wound up killing the guy. Uh, My partner got hit right away seven times. Five of them were direct hits to the body. Two were ricochets, which they took out in the hospital with a tweezer, one from his arm, one from his back. But the five were direct hits. 
One pierced the bag of the heart. He took main medical history, took 72 pints of blood in uh, three hours. Medical history. 72 pints of blood. Did you realize it's just spilling out as they're operating him? They're pumping him full of blood. So anyway, I killed the guy. He ran into me, and I had one bullet left, and I, his gun, my gun was pressed against him. And he had the gun in his hand, and I killed him right there. And later on, and thank, I felt good about this because I saved my life and I saved Pat Cal's life. He wound up living. And uh, when they were interviewing the detectives, when they were investigating this case, the ME says to the detectives, you know you got a homicide here? You have, no, you have an execution here. So the detectives, what do you mean? He says, uh, well, there's powder burns on the body that said the gun was pressed against him. But when I got interviewed at the moment, and in the subsequent hours, I told the detectives exactly what I just said now, that the perp shot at us at three feet or less, and then he ran into me, and I held him with one hand, and he was trying to pass me, but I had my gun pressed against him. If I would have said I shot this guy from three feet away, mm -hmm. I would be indicted. Yeah. You yeah. know, because the ME's report The said, physical evidence says that it, the gun was it, pressed up it, against him. It was comparable to what I said. Right. I said I pressed the gun against him. Right. If I would have sh said the wrong thing, said, well, I was three feet away, right. the ME would dispute my saying and I could be indicted. But, you know, I did have my gun pressed against him, and I said that right away to the investigating officers. Serious question here, uh, Ralph. Uh, what are the chances of you making an off-duty collar on the way home today? <laughs> <laughs> well, we all happen to be in good neighborhoods now. But uh, you what never you know. Say, you know, just on, like man. a Let's cop just on duty. In the car. No, no. Me, you, and Bill, we'll take a ride down to the city, yeah. make a couple of collars. Come on, man. Oh, let's man. do it. This is so buffy. But you know what's funny? When we're filming this thing next in two weeks for Raw TV, my partner's coming up from California. From Florida, and we've discussed it, you know, last night. He says, "Hey, you think I should bring cops?" I said, "You know, it'd be international news. It'd be in all the newspapers. That's right. like, internationally, if we make a collar on the oh, show, you could definitely real. make." I it, think man. that we have so much more to talk to Ralph about, but he's going to have to agree to come back on another day. I, I think, definitely Ralph, agree. You know? When he got the show coming out, or whatever you want to promote, man. Whenever you're yeah. number nice one guest, to have me, it would be my honor again. On behalf of uh, police off the cuff. Bill Cannon, myself, Mark DeMeo. I just wanted to say this was an honor and a pleasure, and you were great, man. You were phenomenal. I, you know, no, it was my honor, and thank you for having me. And you guys were great. And you were always you welcome. You made it easy. And we're going to, uh, we're going to be uh, telling our audience where they can find Street Warrior, uh, the book. Um, we're going to put up that link. We're also going to be putting up links for the, uh, for the TV show. Uh, it's all on Amazon.com. Uh, what was it? Is the TV show again? The Bronx. Uh, two dots. The Bronx. But what was the first part? <laughs> Street Justice. Street Justice. The Bronx. Two dots. The, the Bronx. Bronx. <laughs> and the book is Street Warrior. And uh, I think I think it's up to uh, the people that listen to the the podcast here. And I don't know uh, if we want to see the movie or if we want to see the Netflix uh, the series. Man, I think I think everybody should. Uh, do whatever they can, right in. And you can go visit Ralph right on Bleecker Street at that yeah, pizza place, on too, yep. on the weekends. I'm there. He's Slinging there. pizza. Slinging pizza. Looking to make an off-duty car. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Ralph. Thank you. <laughs>